Well, thank you for joining us today for this new DXV event. Uh, I'm Jean-Jacques Lenard, leader for Lixiel Global Design Americas. And today we're going to be speaking about interior design. We're going to go beyond trends and speak about what makes a home special and what it makes it your own. And to do so, I am joined by a celebrated interior designer and, uh, and author and TV personality, Ned Berkus. And dad, Ned. And, <laughs> husband. and dad, yes, and husband, yes, exactly. sorry. <laughs> thank you for having me, Jean-Jacques. And thank you for, for being with of us. Of course. If I may jump right in and, uh, and maybe go back in the past a little bit, um, why design? What drove you to design? And 25 years after you started your career, what still drives you today? I think design was always a fascination for me because I grew up with a mother who's an interior designer. And so I grew up sort of, do you remember the old wall covering books and things yeah. like that? Mm -hmm. It was my job to take those out of the trunk of the car. And that's so, the work out. yeah, that's of course, it. that's why, you know, I'm in such great shape still, <laughs> thanks to those wallpaper books 35 years ago. Um, no, I think um, I was always around an environment that was constantly changing. Um, rooms were being reassigned. The environment was shifting around me. My mother was very much in search of things that other people didn't have. And so she would bring me on the weekends to antique shops and, and little um, sort of like those multi-dealer antique shops where you have to ask for the key to Oh, you know, get the little vase yeah. in the case. But that was really uh, my childhood, flea markets, estate sales, auctions. Um, and my first job was at an auction house, and my first proper job that didn't involve food um, <laughs> was at an auction house um, in Chicago. And it was just really interesting to me to watch the history of furniture, the history of decorative arts, um, from porcelain to silver to all these different eras and to see homes from the reverse, to see them disassembled and sold. Yeah. Um, it was fascinating and it instilled a curiosity in me and encouraged, I guess, my natural curiosity of a childhood spent being surrounded by design um, and just felt like the only thing I was good at. You know, truthfully, I wasn't going to be a linebacker. I can promise you that. So it was, you know, it, it was an opportunity to, I always wanted to work for myself. It, it worked out. It worked it out. It worked out. And, and I, I imagine that, that what you, it's interesting what you were saying about home being disassembled, that probably connected you to the idea of the story behind the products as well. Right? Completely, completely. And I'm still very much connected to um, the fact that I believe our homes should tell our stories. And the way we do that is through the decisions that we make on what we allow to cross the threshold into our space. And, um, and that, that really stands for everything. For me, I practice what I preach. I don't have a, a coffee mug in my house that I don't like the design of. I, I can't wait to get rid of those ugly things that people give me as presents. Um, I, they immediately get donated or re-gifted. Um, but I, there's a sensitivity around aesthetics and history and memory. Um, I don't, I'm not a snob. I don't need things to be super expensive. That's not interesting to me. Sometimes it is if something's really, really beautiful. But um, as beautiful as the most priceless um, antique selling for the most money at auction in Geneva is the placemat I found in Mexico in the beach town where the lady was hand weaving them and that's what we used to set our table. It's, it's uh, quality doesn't necessarily come in price. It can be at a, at a, on another label in a way. A handicraft, yeah. where it meets quality, things done by hand, they always started as the better things, yeah. the things that someone made with their hands. It, it's been a fascination, it'll always be. Now, you, you started very, very early on, so you were 24 years old, so you yeah. over the years, and it's, but especially at the beginning, what were the, the ups and downs? What were the main challenges? And I think for me, the main challenges were um, sourcing. Because I could sell anything to anybody. I mean, it was that was never a problem for me. If I I, I could sell hair extensions if I really wanted to, um, I don't. But you know, I, it, that was not it. Um, but the challenge was, I think, what people don't understand about design. If you're not in design, like like yourself or or like many designers watching us in this conversation, um, it's just so many details that go into every project, and you're only really as good as your relationships. Um, not only with your clients, but with the people that you find and um, nurture to craft and create and build all of the things that to bring your ideas to life. And so when I first started, I didn't, you know, a client said to me, I'd love to have a wall of custom bookshelves uh, you know, on this wall. And I said, of course, that's a wonderful idea. I agree. And I got in my car and I thought, who's going to build it? 
I, I have no idea. I remember I went to um, the people that designed the Ralph Lauren store in Chicago, and I said, who did your mill work? And that's how I, that's how you, uh, that's how I you know, solved the issue. Um, but it was really a lot of problem solving in the beginning, and it was a lot of not listening to my inner voice, both creatively and also when a project would come and I would just sort of take it for the money, mm -hmm. even knowing that the people may be awful. And I, I made that mistake several times. Did you have to part ways with clients at some point? Sure, or, yeah, yeah absolutely. And I think you know, in business, in, 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 in any industry, um, people just want to know that you're going to be honest and tell the truth and be there if you make a mistake. Um, but sometimes that's not enough. Yeah. Um, mistakes do happen, and sometimes relationships don't work out. Yeah, that's very true. It's, yeah, it is a collaboration, a client to completely, design, yeah. completely relationship. Um, on, during your career, one, one question, one, one thing I was curious about is: um, Have you had any 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 one in particular that have influenced you? Maybe on the business side, but also on the design side. Do you have like any design heroes as well? Huh? I I do have design heroes. I definitely have design heroes. Um, I don't, I like certain things about other people's work. I like a lot of things about other people's work. Um, I, to name like a few names, um, I like such specific things like uh, from Mies van der Rohe um, to how reductionist and simplistic and modern um, and groundbreaking his work was to a lot of the designers from um, the Art Deco period when Details were so important, but not the same sort of fluffy, flowery, cakey mm -hmm. details that were had been happening and been in fashion for so long prior. The Viennese secessionist period, Klimt and, and everything that was going on in the turn of the century in Vienna, all of the design that came from that from there, the silver, the furniture, the paintings, of course the food and the music. But yes. um, but I think um, I'm I'm greatly influenced by other people's work. I live my life basically on Instagram and on auction websites. That's what that's if you if you're looking for me, that's what I'm doing. That's where you're gonna be. Yeah. So, in the names that you just shared, I mean there's a lot of of people who were doing groundbreaking design and innovators because they were kind of breaking the molds yeah. from, uh, from, from trends and, and what was accepted at their time. They were the people that were representing change. Physically, in a tactile way, yes, there was, like, there was just like really strong movements. I think I respond to big, sweeping gestures of originality. That's fascinating, because uh, it, it's something that is con continuously in, uh, in, in motion. And, and one of the things that we were we wonder sometimes is uh, we speak. We are being asked often what are, what is the next trend. What is, uh, but I mean, what do you think about trend? Do you think that I actually... loathe trends. I think they're so obnoxious. I think that they're created to make people feel bad about what they don't have. I think they're created <laughs> to make people buy things that they don't need or want. And also, I think the reason why I'm so opposed to trend, um, you know, it's your job as lead designer to understand what's happening in the market, just as it is my job to understand where people are sort of gravitating to in terms of colors and, and eras and, and periods and shapes. Um, but to me, if somebody asks me what the trends are going to be or what I think the trends were, or what was the worst trend, or what, what's coming up, what's next, what's hot, um, it shows a lack of spending the time to really get to know yourself and your own design personality. My grandmother, when I was growing up, her house was red and white with blue accents, period. That is a hideous color combination for me. I would never live in that, but that is what she loved. So she had blue and white porcelain, and she had a pair of red chairs with you know navy piping, and it was, it was actually beautifully done. She had very good, a very good taste, I think, but, but she was never interested when, in the 1970s, when everything went beige, she could have cared photo, less. Yeah. And, and so, you know, she was very linear in her thoughts that this is what my design style is, this is yeah. how my home will always be. And I have a great admiration for the people that take the time to get to know themselves well enough to know that. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting. I think that trends are, are, are 
reflection of, of an environment. So, so you don't follow the trend you actually create. I mean, exactly. trends are re reflection of what we do. Usually uh, absolutely. Sense. I mean, in product design and the collections that I design, I always try to be like right here. If the trend curve is right here, I always try to be just ahead of it. Yeah. Design like fashion, obviously, I don't wear things that I wore when I was 17 years old. It's embarrassing. But I mean, the, you know, and things come back come now back, yeah. and, and, and everything is cyclical in its own way, a little bit altered, but cyclical. But I think that, you know, as a designer, it's my responsibility to understand the awareness and the level yeah. of awareness out there in the market. Um, do I have to follow it? No. No. I think that's a, that's a very key different differentiation here. Outside of trend, now let's go back to design periods and design okay. styles. Is there one in particular that you connect more with? Or? or is that you're more inspired by? I've always been really passionate about what was happening in design in France in the 1950s. I don't know why I'm so drawn to it. Maybe it's the materials. People were working in limed oak and, and, and ceruzed woods and, and bleached walnuts and, and parchment and bronze. And I love those materials. They, they're, they're like, I want to wear those things. Yeah. I want my watch to be made out of those things. I like. And I, I definitely love the, the the simplicity of the furniture. I love the craftsmanship. How hard it is to make something so so simple out of out of sort of humble ish mm -hmm. kind of things, um, and and do it really well. Um, even some of the straw marquetry and yeah. parquetry and the That's inlays and things that, yeah. are just beautiful. Um, so if you know that's that, unfortunately, it's probably one of the most expensive era, eras of mm -hmm. furniture to to love, yeah. because um, it's just gotten increasingly more valuable over the years. But I, I I do really have a huge admiration for that period. There was a, a house Jean Michel Franck designed mm -hmm. for the Comtesse de Noailles, oh, yes. and I you know I'm sure, yeah. and and it was the first house that was just in Paris at the time, uh, in in France at the time where. Everybody was doing all this like incredible embroidered fabric and these colors and all these things, and it was all white linen slipcovers. Yeah. And that is like uh, that. That is, you know, I ask myself that. I ask my team that when we're working on a project. What's the white linen slipcover? How have we turned direction here? Um, what could be better? What could be a bit more thought provoking? What could be interesting? So um, that would be my answer. The French fifties. I like that answer, obviously. <laughs> It, but it, it was it was very fascinating because you, you're right. Like it's that house. I mean, it, it it's extremely simple, but the connection with the craftsmanship is very hard to do something very well, Super. simple, very very well. Well, and it and was that. also the juxtaposition of modern furniture in a beautiful sort of 18th century environment. So the boiserie yeah. and the woodwork and the the inlay of the floors and the park, parquet flooring and all of the materiality was there. The beautiful old stone fireplaces, of course, stayed. Yeah. But then you had a simple white tuxedo sofa, slip covered in linen, Perfect. washable. Yeah. You know, how amazing. Yeah. That transported, transported me back into Paris here. That was, uh, yeah. thank you. <laughs> um, now, uh, um, another topic that I wanted to cover today is, um, I, I mean, something that is very close to us uh, as, a, as a brand, as a DXV, is the idea of stories. And, and because we, you often speak about stories, and the stories that your client brings through maybe some objects, some heirlooms, some antiques that they have, or that they are going to be looking for. Is that always a starting point for your project? Or, or, or do you ever start with like a blank sheet of paper and say, OK, let's, let's, let's reinvent something? I do start with a blank sheet of paper. Um, it's much more challenging for me. I would have been a terrible painter, a terrible novelist. Um, because it's stressful for me to just start with nothing. Mm -hmm. I much prefer to start with something as a point of inspiration, but sometimes there isn't one. And sometimes that point of inspiration evolves over the course of working with somebody on their home. They start to develop a vocabulary that's different, that's, that, that's new for them. And there becomes an interest or a passion, whether it's in pottery or contemporary paintings or photography or furniture or, or lighting, whatever it is. So sometimes you start with nothing and end up with everything. I always start with the people. I'm much more interested in the people than I am in the space. Who are you? Where are you from? What's your family's heritage? What's the story? Um, do you have anything that was handed down to you? If you don't, is there anything we can ask for that you've always loved yeah. that's sitting in your mother's house um, or grandmother's house? I'm deeply sentimental about things. Um, mm -hmm. That's why the, I wrote 
a book called The Things That Matter, matter, and we're always sort of taught that things don't matter, but they do. They connect us to our past and to our cultures and to the people that we love and the people we've lost. And so that's really the starting point for me. If it comes with 62 pieces of great furniture, great. Great, But if not, we can craft it together. And I think what I'm interested in because of the story, and I know you are at DXV as well, is that I want something to look as good 25 years from the day it was installed as when somebody first saw the room first it, yeah. and for, first interacted with the space. It, it, it's interesting, I'm like a segue here because a lot of our work as, as product designer is about being user-centric, but from a functional standpoint, what you're right. speaking about has to do more with the soul and with, with, with the personality of your client. Well, and I love that where intro. that meets, you yeah, know, if you, exactly. it, it, because it does meet. My husband teases me because when we were renovating our house in LA, there was an antique hardware shop, um, probably one of the best known in LA called Liz's Antique Hardware. Mm -hmm. And I would go in at 10 in the morning when they opened and come out at four o'clock in the afternoon with black fingernails, with like dirt and dust in my hair, probably with bugs, because I was digging through every bin of metal. Um, filthy, I was filthy by the end of the day. It mattered to me so much what the doorknobs would be in our home. And we bought a 1918 home and I wanted, I didn't need to be a purist about it, but I wanted old hardware to work in this old home. And I feel the same way about a faucet. I feel not that they, ha they should be old. In fact, conversely, they shouldn't. But, um, but I think that if you're going to touch something every single day, if you're going to interact with something every single morning, it should be as beautiful as, yeah. as it can be. Yeah. Um, obviously functional, but, but really it, it has to be beautiful. Yeah. Uh, I, this is music to my ear, I would say, so, <laughs> obviously. Now, so speaking about, about that, um, speaking about, about products, so you have your own product collection. Yeah. Um, product collections, because you have a few with living space for your, your furniture line, you have the Shade Store, yep. and uh, Cravat as well, for, uh, do a lot of fabric. If I'm not Textiles, yeah. Lot of textile. Yep. So when, when you do product, where do you draw your inspiration from? Because now there's no story from a client, so right. where, where, what is the process? What is the, well, I, I mean, I, I think everybody should do this if you're in the middle of a renovation or you're considering designing something yourself or, or whatever, but I keep files in my phone of mm -hmm. photographs of things that matter to me, categorized and organized by why they're there. And so I'm an incredibly annoying person to travel with. Like I would be in Naples, Italy with friends going on tours of these cathedrals and my friends would be like, come on. And I'd be photographing the inlay of a stone floor because I could turn that into a textile that somebody may use for drapery someday. Yeah. So inspiration for me really comes from absolutely everywhere. It's not a part of my brain that I can shut off. The more authentic something is, the better. The more I can alter that and create that and take that concept, that beautiful idea that's been there for 400 years mm -hmm. and turn it into something modern that somebody can live with and interact with every day, the more exciting that is for me. And the less expensive I can make it, that's even more. That's even, uh, that's even more, more wonderful. To, uh, yeah. Why to shouldn't you have a soap yeah. dish designed based on the floor of a cathedral yeah. Yeah. in in you know in 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 southern Italy, like for however much you yeah. want to spend? So so travel like you travel huge. Have, have, have a big uh, have a big impact Tra on that. Huge. I'm on my fourth passport, um, mm -hmm. and I and I and now life has changed for me with two children mm -hmm. um, under ten years old. Um, but our kids, it was important to my husband and I that our kids also be really well traveled. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And our daughter flew with us to Rome, was the lead flower girl in a wedding the next day, completely perfect, and no, flew home right. at five years old. At so five that, years old. Yeah, so that's, <laughs> that for me is a huge accomplishment. So she's, she's trained. Their kids are ready to see the world too, yeah. That's the best gift you can give them, I think. I and think so, so. So we spoke about a little bit about interiors. You have, we just spoke about your product collection. How do you look at, at craft and craftsmanship and how does that shape the way you maybe choose your vendors but also create a line, design it, and, uh, and what, what role does it play in all of that? So for me, my area of the marketplace is sort of middle to high. Mm -hmm. Not best, not top, and I know that. And I've always, that was a conscious decision for me 20 years ago when I started designing product. I, I wanted to design things that people could that access. Yeah. And so 
I think that what um, I'm doing that thing that Oprah Winfrey used to do when she's speaking to somebody who has an accent, you're going to start hearing me <laughs> copy you, and then everyone's going to think that we're like and, I'm and, a crazy and, person. And from what you told me last week, you have a little bit of a background that would make it easy yes, for you. Yes, no, as well, I can so under. Yeah, there's <laughs> nothing you can say that I won't understand, okay. being part French myself. But the answer to your question is that it that becomes increasingly challenging for me. Um, when I'm governed by making things affordable mm -hmm. to focus on craft. But like a painter who needs to learn how to draw the perfect apple before they can do a portrait, mm -hmm. I feel like it's my responsibility as a designer to understand the best quality out yeah. there. That is a fascination for me and it's cross category. I want to know where to buy the best socks. I want to know where the most beautiful shoes are made. Mm -hmm. I want the best hat. I don't have to own them, but I just need to know about them. Um, I, I want the best French fry, you know, like it's 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 it, it, it yeah. whatever the craft might be. Um, I'm watching this show right now um, called The Bear on Hulu. That yeah. uh, uh, he works in the Chicago beef place, and he's making the best beef sandwich with the best bread. And I relate to that. I think that's I think that's absolutely fascinating. So I think that for me, no matter what price point I'm designing for, I, I know it's my job to know where that came from and what the what the most exquisite, rarest, handmade version of that could be. Mm -hmm. And then I can make decisions from that level on how to make it um, accessible. That, that makes a lot of sense to me because it, it is quality in design very often comes from from the inside, from how it's made. It's put of together. course. And if you don't understand it at the best, at the higher levels, and you can't. Then you can't. You can't you, control you, you, it, you, you can't control Yeah, it. So you can't draw, paint, you know, the Sistine Chapel if you can't draw an apple. Draw an apple. You yeah, can't. I, I wholeheartedly agree. We spoke about design trends already. Um, now, for, for someone who is, who is not so design savvy, who is not, and, and I, I don't like saying it that way, because I think we all have appreciation for environment and so forth. but. Um, for someone who hasn't gone through that process before, what is what would be a, a first step or an easy way to reimagine your home? You know, I think that it's a really important step. Um, and even me, who I've been in design now for 26 years almost, I, I still do this myself, is to gather a visual library of images um, that resonate with you. They don't have to be the exact, they shouldn't actually be the exact room you want to create, yeah. but color combinations or the way sort of furniture has been laid out. The juxtaposition of, of different elements and different periods, if you see something that's really striking, you should save that photo so that when you embark on your renovation or your redecoration project, you have a, a sort of um, this inspiration that's been edited by you, by your eye. What I think really special about that as well is that then even if you choose to hire a designer, you're not obliged to, obviously there's never one right way to do a room, we all know that. But if you do choose, you have that information and they can help you interpret that. It's just too easy now with Pinterest, with Instagram, with, um, with every catalog for every auction and every book available online and all these historic images. That's what we did as a team throughout COVID. Yeah. If we loved something, I didn't know that French 50s furniture was largely manufactured in Beirut until I dug in yeah. during the pandemic and had the time to really and this is something I've loved and collected for 20 years. So, you know, it, yeah. it, it was it was really you learn new things every day. And I think we can all sit at our at our kitchen tables and and craft that visual library yeah. of things that that really resonate with us and then um, go through that and edit it even further to, to see what in each image really matters to you. Because you, as you said, it's not about necessarily replicating something. It's really no. about creating an environment and a mood that exactly that worst nightmare. By the way, yeah. the, oh, it's always the weird thing that everyone thinks is ugly that I like the best in the room. It's the funny painting brought down from the attic of the grandparents' house that they are modernists and they think it that doesn't work with their style. And I'm like, no, no, no. It's that juxtaposed in combination in symphony with what is your style that is really that no one else can have so so that that goes somewhere else also it's about dialogues now 100 is, 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 is a relationship between objects and between 
textures or building a room is for me is only about a dialogue how, how every decision of every surface of every angle of every space is what is the dialogue between the sofa and the table what is the dialogue between the painting on the wall and the chest beneath it or the mm -hmm. pair of chairs the fabric on the chairs and the lighting and is it a lamp or sconces they all speak to each other and and if they're all singing the same song it's not as interesting to me yes that's a and, and, and I imagine the views and the outside when, when you have that intersection as well and, uh, and, uh, and that, uh, that relationship of course. Yeah, as well. Yeah, of course. And, and the environment and the, you know, the, the locale and all of that is super relevant. But even so, you know, some of the most interesting interiors I've ever seen or ever been in are the ones where people broke the rules and, and really put, were very heavy, heavy and sure-footed in, in, in pushing forward a style that was really their own. What beauty! We have the opportunity to choose anything. Yeah. Um, you know, take the time to figure out how to make those choices well. Uh, what would be your advice for, let's say, the three areas that, that one should pay attention to um, well, before embarking <clears throat> into a project like this? I think my rule of thumb has always been if you are building it into the house, it needs to be of quality that will last. And it should be something that is well designed enough that it's it's not loud it it's it's elegant 20 years from now you should still love your countertop stone you should still love your cabinetry you should still love your faucet you should still love your sink anything else is fair game you know you can take a mirror off a wall and move it to 20 different places we do that every weekend in my house my husband me and the kids i'm like can, oscar could you hold the tape measure please you're not locked into anything that 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 anything besides what's really built into the home. But the focus really on, on what is built into the home, you really should take your time and, and, and reach for things that are as timeless as possible. I remember being at the Kitchen Bath show many years ago and mm -hmm. walking through the huge room. I'm sure you've been there a thousand yeah. times, it's mm -hmm. awful. And like touching the, this countertop, I was like tired because it's 600 miles yeah, of walking. Uh, and right. I leaned against this countertop and it turned like orange and then it turned purple and then it turned gray and then it turned green. And, and the owner of the company, super sweet, was like, can we send you information? And I was like, absolutely not. No, right. I will never install this in anybody's house. I'm sure it's right for somebody. I'm not sure, you know, it, very Acapulco 1970s to yeah. me. Maybe illegal sub substances should be involved, but it'll never be <laughs> in any of my projects because it, it's the antithesis of what matters to me yeah. in the home. Yeah, surprisingly enough, that, that trend doesn't seem to be coming back. Like, no, it's know, gone. It's gone. It was like, it, I, I think he had a very good show. <laughs> And then, you know, that's it. Last question on, on, on this uh, series. What, if there was only one space, one object, or one piece of furniture that you could splurge on, which one would that be? Wow. Um, it's a tough one. Yeah. I've, no, it's not tough at all. I found it last night online while my husband was watching his stupid TV show. Um, it's a um, it's a Lalan. And if you guys don't know this designer, please Google it, L-A-L-A-N-N-E. Mm -hmm. um, it's a Lalan uh, table shaped like a bird, like, um, a, bird. like a bird. It's it's it, it's incredibly beautiful, um, French, obviously, um, 1940s, 50s, 60s, something, right around there. It, it's the price of an airplane. I'll never own it, but I admire it so much. What what what? Uh... What attract you to, to whimsy? It? I love I love the quality. L Lalan, you know, did, did did all the sheep and yeah, everything, yeah. and and Yves Saint Laurent collected, and yeah. Pierre Berger, and all these people that had really the money and the the access to have yeah. anything in the world, and they sell at auction for millions and millions of dollars. Um, but what attracted it, it to me is that I laughed out loud when I saw it for the first time many years ago, mm -hmm. and I thought, what? How great is this? Um, my husband Jeremiah says that I am drawn to like things with an animal motif and our home will be running in Architectural Digest, our new home um, in the upcoming year. And you'll see in our children's bedroom, it's like we might have gone a little heavy with the mystical creatures and <laughs> mythological, you know, <laughs> everybody, griffins and whoever else is welcome. There's a bath mat that's a tiger. I mean, I just, it, I don't know. I, I love animal motifs in design for some reason. I'm drawn to them, not just for kids. Um, and and this Lalan table is particularly beautiful. That's what I would own. If you have That's an extra $10 million or so whatever I'll, it might I'll, be worth I'll, now. Keep that in mind. Great. Yeah, so. <laughs> we have to sell a lot of sinks. <laughs> uh, quite a few, yeah. So a little bit of um, rapid fire questions, if you don't mind. Not at all. 
Shiny or matte? Matte. Chrome or brass? Brass. Natural finish or lacquer? Natural. Dark or light walls? Light. Warm tone or cool tones? That's too site dependent for me to answer. I'm not sure. Totally understand. Uh, patterns or solids? I'm really trying to be better with pattern. I just want to say this. I really would love to be more talented and better at mixing pattern, but I'm going to, I mean, you, give you, me a Belgian you. linen or a cashmere or a leather or a suede any day, and I'm happy. But, I mean, but I mean, there's a lot of stripes in the house now. I was going to say, you, you've got some, uh, some textile collections that, that have beautiful patterns. No? There's, so, yeah, I love, and we draw all of those patterns internally, and they're all based on, on travels and old yeah. Greek motifs and things like that. Um, I just finished a project for Apex for Celebrity Cruises, and we designed all the outdoor pillows based on overall patterns from ancient Greek motifs that Kravit manufactured for me. And it, it you know, it, that's all like fascinating. But in my own home, I can barely wear patterned clothing. I always feel like I'm in a costume, like I'm in a Western. <laughs> I put on a plaid shirt, and I feel like I'm like I'm a cartoon. It's, it's off, off character. Yeah, so. yeah. It's just a little, yeah. Bath or shower? Uh, shower, always shower. I like to look at a bath. I love it's a bath. Object, yeah. Ab absolutely love a bath. I think it's there's nothing more luxurious than a bath. But I can't stand being in a bath. I don't have the time. Neutral or color? Neutral. And classic or modern? Classic. Classic. Yeah. So um, speaking, actually, first before we get to that, I'm going to get back to the bath or shower afterward. But uh, um, in in your house, what's your what's your favorite room? The laundry room. The laundry room. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Because I am a, a Virgo. And for people who don't understand sort of what that astrological sign typically represents, it represents like high levels of organization. organization. So nothing is more relaxing to me than like a series of clear bins with labels on them that had, say, you can still see what's in the bin because they're mm -hmm. clear, but like batteries, tape, paint, hardware. So our laundry room, we just renovated the apartment and moved home to our, mm -hmm. an apartment that we used to own, Jeremiah and me, mm -hmm. before we moved to LA and then moved back to New York. And my fantasy was the laundry room. And I, and I built my fantasy. I see your pattern here because you're, the way you organize your picture on your phone seems to be uh, it's, uh, yeah. following the same. It's really, uh, it's really, really true. It's really, really true. So if not design, you would have been a li librarian? Maybe, I would or, have loved yeah. it. Although I always had a really? tough time figuring out where the letters oh, went. So, yeah. It was really frustrating for me as a, as a kid. It was more math than visual it's somehow. Tough. So now, now the bathroom. Um, how important is a bathroom in, in a home and in the projects that you that you work on? And, and do you think that the role of that room has changed the last two, two and a half years? Well, I know it's changed in my own home because I, there's no privacy in our house at all. Yeah, I mean, I stand in the shower and the children are like, Oscar's like, my, our four-year-old is asking me to remove like one Lego from the other Lego. I'm like shampooing my hair. I mean, that's every parent I think in the yeah, world understands stage, that. Yeah. I'd love, I, what I, bathroom should have locks. Let's say that, yeah. let's start with that. That's a good start. Um, yeah, and not four year olds running around. But I do think the bath has changed. I think that it's an in incredible focus. I think that the market has demanded that bathrooms be amazing. Um, ask any real estate broker. Um, you cannot get away with sort of selling your house any longer without, you know, having invested in the yeah. kitchen and in the bathroom, those two spaces. I, I think, you know, for me, the bathroom is really the height of luxury. It's this place where you really do spend so much time getting dressed to go out, getting dressed in the, getting, you know, bathed or showered in the morning. Um, so many rituals happen yeah. in the bathroom. I love like, there's, you know, I always have a, a, a a coffee cup sitting on, on a stone ledge that we built and I built the ledge behind our sink for that reason. To me it's like the smell of hot coffee and sort of good shampoo and and you know that moment for many parents where you actually do have a little bit of solitude. It's an escape in, a, in its own way. Um, I think the materials of the bath are super important, probably more important than anywhere else in the house. Maybe equal to the kitchen but you know, you can mm -hmm. get away with more in, in a kitchen, I think, than you can in a yeah. bath. So it's a space of quality. It's a space of inspiration. It's a space of tranquility, um, practicality. I think it's of huge importance in design. It, it, it's interesting. I, I spent some years in, in consumer electronics. So the so living room was a family room. It used to be where people were investing. Yeah. And the last 15, 20 years, actually, on, on a per square foot 
basis, yeah. bathroom and kitchen, but especially bathroom, have become the most expensive real estate in the home. Right? Absolutely, so, so, absolutely. So. Design knows no upper limit. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, you can you can spend any amount of money on on designing a bathroom. Um, you don't have to, but you mm -hmm. can. You can. Um, and I tend to reach for things that have been around since the 1920s. If a material's been around since then, I feel comfortable building it in. Going back to what we were talking about earlier about me believing that what you build into your home should be of quality and, and not date itself and be timeless. You know, if a material or um, has been there, a finish or something that looks like it that's maybe been improved technologically, um, but I, I really, you know, I don't really want to see a sea of quartz. Yes. You know, mm -hmm. it's not, I mean, we, you know, everyone's so worried about maintaining marble. Like the streets are made of marble in Rome. Yeah. It's okay. It can have a little scratch on it. It's, it's like, you know, it's quite all right. yeah, yeah, look at so. the fudge shop in your town. Yeah. Everybody's rolling out the candy on a yes. big marble thing. No one's worried about putting their cup down on it. It's no. fine. No. I totally agree. We, we spoke about the bathtub. <laughs> That's why I'm coming back to the bath versus shower. shower. What is the centerpiece of the, um, of the bathroom? What is, what is, uh, so the, the iconic piece for you? Is it's, it it's for sure the tub. I mean, only because of the inherent architecture and the amount of space vertically and horizontally yeah. that it takes up. And I think that the tub is always an opportunity to create, a freestanding tub is always an opportunity to symmetry or asymmetry. Mm -hmm. it's, it's an opportunity to do something incredible, um, float it and have a beautiful antique table sitting next to it or a rustic bench sitting next to it with towels rolled or folded. If it's against a wall, what is the wall? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I've been fixated on, on, on shaping marble and, and sort of having marble carved and cut oh, yeah. and OG'd on, in these beautiful sort of Venetian ways or European ways. It's not that much more expensive if you're working mm -hmm. with slabs of stone yeah. to do a detail like that. Even over the doors uh, and over around the, you know, above the shower yeah. entrance, um, to add that we had that at our house in Los Angeles, we did it again, um, even in the children's bathroom here in New York City. I think the tub really does sort of dictate the layout, it so you have to. It has to be the most important thing. With that being said, when when you approach the design of a of a bathroom for a client, um, how how do you approach it, and do you start with? locating that bathtub or do you start somewhere else? Like what is that? We, we definitely start with the floor plan and the actual schematic plan of the space before we talk about anything fun and, and beautiful. Yeah. And my office and I will manipulate, manipulate everything based on what we think the sight lines will be, mm -hmm. how beautiful it will be. What do you see when you first walk in the door? When you're standing at the vanity and looking through the mirror, what is the reflection behind you? Maybe it's just mm -hmm. a painting hung on the wall on a nail. It doesn't have to be some, you know, some always some enormous, no. Maybe it's an old bookcase with glass doors that, that's styled beautifully. But, you know, we're very, I'm very conscious of what, when you turn a corner, what, 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 what's in your sight line. And the bathroom is probably the place where that's most intense for me um, because we just spend so much time in there that if you're gonna spend the money and the time on a renovation um, or building a home, you really need to get it right. And, and it's also, very often a space that it may be one of the most the most smaller space in in, in the house right? yeah it's uh, yeah. not always but not but always but often and often. then that that then brings up qu questions of storage yeah and and is should storage be concealed should it be open should it be a mix yes but you know like you know is there you know you know it, there's a lot of really good questions that you have to ask yourself when designing a bathroom, bathroom. that are really important and, um, and I mean, you now it's more part of the of the, the decoration of the bathroom. But when when it comes down to fittings, how how do you go about choosing finishes? And then do you have finishes that you like to reuse over and over again? It really is dependent on the project for finishes for me. I don't mind mixing metals. I don't think that that's a thing. Like you know, people have these beautiful old aged brass vintage doorknobs, and they want a, a nickel bathroom. Well, any great hotel in the UK. 90% yeah. yeah. of the bathrooms are all polished nickel. So, yeah. you know, and, and they're not worried about the hinges. So no. I, I think people feel like they have to follow all these rules and, and I'm not sure that you do. 
Um, one bathroom in my home has chrome fixtures that I didn't select. I just couldn't afford to change them. Mm -hmm. But I hung these beautiful Italian glass and aged brass hooks that I bought at an auction. It, does it bother me that the, the fixtures are chrome and the, the decorative hooks are brass and glass? Not really. Not really like, no. I'm, I'm okay with it. Um, it would bother me if anything was ugly, and it's not, so that's, you know, fine. I tend to reach now for unlacquered bronze um, or classic, uh, I'm sorry, unlacquered brass or, or classic brass and bronze. I've personally moved a little bit away from black just because I feel like it's, a, it's you know, alone. It, yeah. it, it's, it's not um, for me, but there's clients that, that absolutely adore it. And yeah. I think in, in very modern architecture and very modern spaces, I'm not sure that you have another better option than that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's what I mean when I say it's truly dependent on, on, the on the project. I'm not married yeah. to one or the other. I, I like what you were saying about unlike a brass because it's, it seems that there is, um, and we spoke about, in a way, about depth in, in, yeah. in, in, in the materials and the finishes that you have around you. So that's what this provides you in a way. It's something Completely. that is alive and will evolve over, evolve I, over time. And I love that. And I love, you know, our jewelry turns, our rings turn colors, our... You know, I, I don't believe that we should be beholden to our possessions. I think that's why people work with products that you design because, uh, and people like yourselves, your, yourselves design, because if, if somebody smart is dealing with the whole infrastructure of something and then has designed it thoughtfully enough for it to be really well functioning for the end user, then let it get like a little let let patina happen. That's yeah. life. I you know ninety percent of what we use in our projects is vintage or antique because it's already ruined. So you know the finish is already imperfect. Like my my kids don't aren't obliged to like walk around with little white gloves. I want them to you know if they make another ding in a in a cabinet, it, there's nine hundred other dings on that door. Yeah. Go for it. And that's what gives it its, its texture and, it, and again, it is yes, depth, the know, life. So, the, yeah, the, life. Absolutely, yeah. that's yeah. life. So um, I just want to finish with uh, with uh, going back to DXV a little bit. So when when we started speaking, what what was the connection? What connection did you feel with with saw Brian? Was there some was there something in particular that you connected with? I definitely. I think that for me, what has been most interesting about understanding DXV as a brand, understanding you, Jean Jacques, and sort of what your inspiration has been, was the tie to history, the four sort of moments in time, the eras that you've dug so deeply into craft the collections from, um, how connected it the DXV is to story, sort of where the shapes came from. Um, you know, I, did I ever think 20 years ago I would be sitting having a conversation ever with somebody about the fact that the back of a toilet could be based on a bell jar? No, <laughs> but here we are. You know, so I think I think it was the fact that DXV as a brand has created a range of products that um, that do sort of honor history, that do honor different time periods, and that goes back to me saying, don't be lazy and buy a picture from a catalog. Take the time to get to know yourself well enough and your own design personality and collect those images of things that really matter to you. And then you'll know what sort of era, what kind of period really speaks to you and what collection to buy. I'm glad to hear all of that because we, we do put a lot of a lot of time and, and, and our heart to uh, actually develop these stories on the products. And it's true that it's 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 what makes their value in a way. So yeah. I think each, each one of our collection takes like three to four years to design and it's because it takes time to shape a yeah, it's exactly. Not, uh, and that's that I don't think a lot of people would know that it takes three to four years to start with a concept based on a historic period or a time um, or an era and and really build that out in a way that marries quality and function and longevity with sort of pure reference and pure history. Last for regarding all these movements and, our, and the collections in our in, in in our in our portfolio, is there one or two in particular that you you're connecting with uh, to you, these days? You know, funny we've had this really nice conversation, and I thank you for your sort of well chosen questions. Um, it's actually Etra, which you know Etre, because it's the it's it's it which I believe is one of the newest yes, collections. It's the latest one, yeah. And it's very linear and extremely modern, and I'll tell you why I'm the most connected to it. I don't love a fussy kitchen. I like a, a cleaner kitchen. I'll, I'll go to the ends of the earth to find the proper cabinet knobs and, 
and the the detail on the cabinets and 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 and, and millwork and everything. I drive myself crazy about those details, and I don't like a fussy kitchen fixture. Sure, yeah. I like mm -hmm. something that is very sort of streamlined, but you had me at the detail of the sort of engine turning mm -hmm. that reminds me of like the old sort of sterling frames that you find at the flea markets in England and the sort of beautiful detail that you see in watchmaking, which I love watches, I love jewelry, I love, you know, looking at that and and the fact that it had that detail at the at the at the tip that you pulled down the and spray. you know mm -hmm. it was at the spray yeah it was modern and then historic in a in a really beautiful way and and in um, in the bathroom any any other any other there, product or collection it, again it's product dependent i mean i mean it's a it's site dependent for yeah. me because i i relate to the four sort of collections and and periods in very different ways i love the romance of of the of the country house of the weekend house of the historic you know I, my mind goes to savannah and charleston yeah. and 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 these things and um jeremiah and i are working on our own project in portugal and i could see a very weird sort of combination of this american country farmhouse, classic yeah. farmhouse mm -hmm. moment working very beautifully in the alentejo which yeah. is not something i think a lot of people would reach for um but there's nothing i don't like i just i like to i, pr I like to know the story behind everything and i think right. that's what people should be asking why why this shape why this why why this design um the vanities that that um with the inlay and the that's little the sort of shire. yeah the logo uh, on the embossed oh, on yeah, the leather tag the modulus, the model old one, saddlery yeah. like all of that like it's it's really interesting you know we actually found a factory in europe that uh, makes wristband for luxury watch yeah. brands basically and that's that's how we knew we had the right quality because this is a, a an area that you're going to touch with even wet hands sometimes yeah and uh, so we wanted to make sure that the, it would stay so it's tanned properly exactly. and yeah exactly. that's so see and it's, it's so funny because i didn't i noticed that right away with the first time i what's the name of that vanity uh, that's a modulus modulus i i noticed it right away when i touched it that it felt like a watch band yeah. and it felt like something that was again jewelry for the home in in a way that was also very practical I'd love to see that with thumbprints on it from years yeah. of use, like an old saddle or exactly, your very yeah. favorite watch band that yeah. starts to mellow with time. Right, so, patina, yeah, exactly. Time, Leather, yeah. I mean, everyone's yeah. favorite pair of shoes, favorite work bag. Yeah. You know, that's, I, I assume that's maybe what you intended. That, so. That's exactly where we were going. With <clears> that, yeah. so, it's pretty. Thank you so much for, for sharing all your thoughts and, uh, and, and for what I find is a, a very insightful discussion. Really appreciate that. My pleasure. And uh, I know we have another event scheduled, I think, later in the, in the fall. So I'm really looking yep. forward to, uh, to continuing this discussion again well, with you. Well, thank you for inviting me to the DXV Think Tank headquarters, <laughs> secret headquarters. Secret Here I am. So. <laughs> Thanks well, again. It was a pleasure. My pleasure.